and then quality as a shepherd. Matthew 20, 28, just as the Son of Man did not come to serve, but uh, to be served, but to serve, and to give his life a ransom for many. What are the differences between serving others and getting something from others? So, Jesus came not to be served, but to serve. He came to serve people and to give his life a ransom for many. So, Jesus came not to be served, but to serve people. So we too, we want to come and go and serve people and not to be served. Now, sometimes people want to serve us, it's fine, but we don't seek that. We don't seek to be served, we seek to serve people. So what are the differences between serving others and getting something from others? Now some people, they just want something to get something from people. They want to get more money, they want them to do more work now. It's right for them to serve God. But sometimes people make use of the members. Uh, we want to encourage them to serve God with a willing heart. Uh, we want to encourage them and give them the responsibilities. But we are not making use of the people. So we serve other people. It means that when we know their need, we want to help them. Or we assign someone to help them. We want to pray for them. We want to counsel them. We want to help them to overcome their problems. Matthew 25, 40. Inasmuch as you did it to one of the least of this, my brethren, you did it to me. Why do people sometimes despise un unimportant people? How can we have compassion on them? So Jesus said, when you did it to one of the least of my brother, you did it to me. So when we serve Jesus' little brothers, that means us, unimportant uh, Christians, that important, uh, the Christians seem not, you know, their life is not so important, that they are just a small person, and uh, that, but when we do it to one of them, we are doing it to Jesus. But why do people sometimes despise unimportant people? Because people think, well, they cannot give much money, they, they, uh, and they're not important, they cannot contribute much, then they are despising these people. But we don't want to despise anyone. And uh, Jesus said, you know, when you're faithful, faithful in a small, in a small things, then you're faithful in the large, uh, important things. That means we want to be faithful to serve the unimportant people, the small people, the children or the weak people. And, uh, and many people despise unimportant people because <clears throat> they think they, you know, these people cannot give much money, <clears throat> they cannot contribute much, they cannot contribute much, and then they despise them. And then that way Jesus doesn't like that. How can we have compassion for them? that we remember what we do for them is doing to Jesus. So we, we, um, we don't despise what we do for them. We say this is important, that what I do for them is very important. God is very happy with me. So we can applaud ourselves for helping any person, any small, unimportant person, that we help them and then we can encourage ourselves and say, I'm doing to the little one and Jesus is happy with me. But we don't want to get proud. We just want to encourage ourselves and say, I have helped this person and God is happy with me. Why is it important to accept people? How can we accept weak Christians? Accepting is loving people. It's important to accept people and uh, because then is loving one another as Christ has commanded us to love people, accept them as they are. And how can we accept weak Christians? That we understand that they have the weakness, they continue to sin and we understand that. And we want to forgive them and accept them and love them and help them. So that's how what I mean by accepting them, to be willing to help them to understand it might take time from, for them to grow. But we will encourage them to grow by telling that, them that God loves you, your life is very precious, you are very important. When you love God and obey God, God is happy to bless you and God will bless you. So it's better for you to love God and respond to God. Now instead of pushing people to change, we tell them, 
when God is pleased with you, He will bless your whole life and your life will go higher and higher. So it's better for you to repent and obey God. So we guide these people to repent. And, uh, and when they fall again, we don't get discouraged and we don't yell at them. We still pray for them and encourage them to, to love God more. Okay, 1 Peter 5, 2, shepherd the flock of God. Verse 3, not as being lords over those who entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. Yes, all of you be submissive to one another and be clothed with humility. So Peter here talked to the shepherds, to the pastors. Shepherd the flock of God, not as being lords over those who entrusted to you. So not as someone who controlled the people. Now, the Bible does talk about submit to another, submit to your leaders. But it doesn't mean the leaders will control the members. Now, some people would look at submit to your pastor to mean that the pastors can control the people. There are many pastors who serve like kings. They, have, they control everyone in a very tight manner. And no one can tell them any problems about uh, about the pastor that they they cannot tell this pastor about his problem that uh, people can only uh, be supportive they cannot say no to anything he says so this is being controlling a humble pastor should be willing to listen to people he teach to people to obey him and he also submit to the people because it says here be submissive to one another so the people submit to the pastor and the pastor submit to the people. He will listen to them and respond to their needs. Then we are examples to this flock and be clothed with humility. Some pastors only emphasize submission of the members. What does this passage teach? This passage teach that be submissive to one another, not just people submitting to the pastor. How to be submissive to one another? So the members should submit to the guidance of the pastor. But then when the, pa when the people suggest to the pastor, maybe there is some better way. Uh, maybe there is some fault with this certain way. Can we seek other ways? Can we pray and seek other ways? The pastor should say humbly and say, okay, let us pray and seek God's wisdom. And then let us talk about it and find out is there a better way to handle this problem. So the pastor should submit to the suggestion of the people. And then quality as a shepherd. God desires mercy. How can we develop mercy? We develop mercy by telling ourselves that when we bless people, when we shepherd people, God is very happy. God, you know, says, Jesus said, you have done it to me. So we encourage ourselves. When we do it to a little one, when I have mercy on them, have compassion on them, God is very happy with me. So we can encourage ourselves that we seek ways to be helpful to people. Now, but we can decide the direction of our ministry. I want to say this. The direction of our ministry should be more emphasized on the people who are willing to follow God. Now, we want to help, help each person in the church. And we want to assign leaders to help each person of the church. But the pastors should pay more attention to the people who are serving God, who are willing to serve God. Because these people will help other people. So the pastor will shepherd the leaders and the leader will shepherd others. Um, that the pastor should put more time into these leaders who are, or people who are willing to serve God. Then these people can do better, can do uh, better when the pastors minister to them. Now, but then from time to time, there are members who ask help from the pastor. The pastor still, still help them. And then sometimes he would assign someone to help them. So the pastor should not despise the, uh, a weak member. But he should put more attention to the members who are willing to serve God. That way, he will build up these people to, have, you know, to bring more uh, growth to the church. And also, these leaders can help uh, the the other Christians. So 1 Corinthians 
9.22, to the weak I become, I became as weak, that I might win, might win the weak. Paul was willing to go down to the level of the people in order to win them. How do we do that? So to the weak, he became weak as weak. So we want to uh, be humble with them. When they say, I have committed certain sins, and we can tell them, yes, we have committed sins too. We have, there were times that we were weak too, that uh, we have weaknesses too, but we trust in God and God give us strength. So we tell them we are not without sins, but we just overcome the sins with the help from God. So we tell them, you know, we too have this, uh, you know, sinful thoughts, but I will stop it right away. I will stop the sinful thoughts right away. Uh, you know, I'm not free from sins. I still have sinful thoughts, but I will stop the sinful thoughts immediately when they come to me. And Proverbs 12:15. The way of a fool is right in his own eyes, but he who heeds counsel is wise. So the way of the fool is right in his own eyes. He's always say, the fool always says that I'm right, I'm right. But he who heeds counsel is wise. When he listens to counsel, then listen to the suggestion of people, then he is wise. So why do some leaders unwilling to accept the opinions of others? Because they think that only they can understand God's will. They are proud. They don't accept the wisdom of the people. So we want to listen to the people. Now, but God chose leaders who, are, who loves God for reason. They, they must have wisdom. They have, must have the presence of God. But still, they're not perfect. They need to listen to the people. They, listen. they need to submit to the needs of the people. So what motivates us to accept opinions of others? Uh, that the motivation is that we too have weaknesses and sometimes we don't have uh, we don't have uh, the complete wisdom we never have the complete wisdom so we need the wisdom of other people to work together so uh, when we have collect when we have the collective wisdom from all the people then we are more wise okay and then principles in ministry now we have talked about this before but now Today we go through these questions. If a church worker gossip, what will happen? So it's very important that we don't gossip. When we gossip that, what happens is, you know, what we say will spread to other people. Because when people hear gossip, they will spread it. Many people spread it. Most people will spread gossip. So we want to, as people who serve God, we must, you know, restrain our mouth that we don't want to gossip. And when we tell people, we gossip to people, these people will spread it. And then our reputation will become terrible, that people will say the pastor gossips. So it's very important that we don't gossip, and then we lose the trust of the people. And also, God is not pleased with us when we gossip. And then two, when people accuse others, what will happen? How can we stop accusing people? So this is another principle, not to accuse people. Now, some, sometimes ministers will do this. They, even in a the message, they'll say, you people don't read the Bible. You people don't pray. They don't, you don't trust in God. You don't do evangelism. You're lazy. So if, people, if pastors accuse people like that, what will happen is it doesn't encourage the people to change. The people just get, they feel they are yelled at. They get discouraged. And they always think about their faults. Now, as Christians, when we think about our faults, we want to repent. And then we want to think more about God and also think about what we have done for God. And then we say, I've changed. Thank God I've changed. So there might be things we have not changed. But we have things that we change. So we have our weaknesses. If we look at our weaknesses all the time, then we will stay weak. But we look at the things we have done, we have looked at our strengths, then we'll say, thank God I have improved. Thank God I have helped this person. Thank God I'm growing. Then we have more strength. So we want to tell people too about their strengths, what they've done for God, to encourage them instead of just telling them what they have not done. It's like a parent. If a parent just tell his child, uh, you never do things well, you never 
uh, and you always miss something. The child might have done something good, but the parents always just look at what he has not done. Then the child feel very, you know, uh, he's always accused. He feel unhappy and he's not motivated to change. Accusation doesn't change people. Satan accuse people, but we don't want to accuse people. We want to, uh, we want to tell them about the good things and God loves them. If they have sins, we guide them to repentance. We tell them, God loves you. When you repent, God is very happy. And I'm very happy. When you repent and trust in God, your life will be blessed by God. So we want to give them hope instead of accusing them and making them feel bad. So how can we stop accusing people? We want to look at the good things of people and we learn, want to learn from God and Jesus that when Peter was about to deny him three times, Jesus did not say, well, how can you do that? He, Jesus said, I pray for you so that you won't lose your faith. And when you turn back, strengthen your brothers. So Jesus has prayed for him so that he will not lose his faith. So Jesus, instead of accusing him, he has prayed for him and encouraged him that he has prayed for him so that he would not lose faith. And then he tell them, when you turn back, then you can strengthen your brothers. So um, Jesus did not accuse him. So God always give us hope. Now even to the Israelites, Jesus said, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you know, I have want you to uh, want to gather you like a hen want to gather the chicks, but you are not willing. So uh, even when Jerusalem has stoned to death the prophets, uh, killed those who were sent to him to, to Jerusalem, but still Jesus want to say words to them and say, I want to gather you. Please repent and come to me and I'm willing to accept you. So Jesus always give people hope. If a person steals money in a church, what will happen? How can we prevent that? Now what will happen is then he's tearing down his ministry and then the worst scenario is that he can lose salvation and he can go to hell. So how can we prevent that? That when, whenever we have any sinful thoughts, any thought that I can take some money from that and say that this would destroy and cancel all my ministry and cancel my life and I can lose salvation. I never want to touch that money that is assigned for God, that I want to use it wisely. So being alert to any sinful thoughts, any kind of uh, love for money, love for women, love for power, any kind of sinful thoughts, we want to be sensitive and know that it's destructive. Now the five steps to victory are first aware, aware of sinful thoughts. Second is destructive. Three, what does the Bible say? Tell me to do. What does the Bible tell me to do? And then pray to repent, ask God to forgive and give me strength. And five, I choose to obey. I choose to put down the sinful thought of lust, of love for money, for love for power. I want to put those down and choose not to take that money and to say, if I take that money, terrible things will happen to me. Number four, why do sex scandals happen in the church? What damage would they bring? How to avoid temptation from opposite sex? Sex scandals happen in the church for many reasons. One reason is that many people are not satisfied with their marriage. They um, You know, they have quarrels with their wife and then the wife is unhappy with them and so they are unhappy and, uh, and then they find that another woman will listen to him and satisfy him, uh, make him happy and uh, because the wife has strong sense of responsibility so very often the wife would, you know, uh, want to make sure things are going well. And also now, as I explained before, men and women have a basic difference. Men like you know, pay attention to tasks, uh, to work, to 
objectives what to do in the future projects to do accomplish things so men want to accomplish things while now women want to accomplish things too but men are more uh, more uh, their mind is more on business on doing things and then women are more interested in relationship and taking care of emotions and talking about emotions and and uh, so women will help each you know they want to uh, talk about their feelings because women care about people and they care about being loved so they want to be loved so after marriage many men don't want to listen to the wife and say you always nag you always nag you always have demands but when the husband listen to her and respond to her and uh, and and then care about her and then she will feel she will be satisfied and then she won't nag that she will have confidence that the husband will listen to her now also of course the wife need to learn to be uh, sensible that she doesn't you know get out of control with his emotions she want to tell the husband about her feelings about what she wants and how she wants the communication to be that way both the husband and the wife will be satisfied that they want to build up a good marriage now for myself i listen to my wife and i encourage her i uh, I, I i tell her i love her i like her i i'm happy to be with her i'm kind to her i'm helpful to her and she's always nice to me and she loves me very much and so we always do nice nice thing to each other and whenever we have any problem we we'll talk through it we don't just leave it alone we want we must talk through it so that's how our relationship is that way our relationship will be an encouragement to us then we can enjoy each other and then we are built up in the relationship then I don't want also because of my uh, love for God and love for my life I don't want any other woman to take away this good relationship I don't want any woman to destroy this relationship so I'm very careful with women that you know that uh, the, all the handling with women is just ministry or business or just doing things and uh, serving God together but there is a distance I don't go deeper with them uh, and talk about my deep things I don't want to uh, build up uh, a dependence on them or for them to depend on me I would guide them to be independent to handle the problems themselves so uh, this is very important that we build up the relationship with the spouse and with the children and uh, and then with church members that a healthy relationship that way will prevent uh, sex scandals uh, sc sex scandals happen when people don't have satisfaction in a marriage and they uh, then they need counseling they need help now if any of you need help you can let me know and then I can help you I can guide you uh, we must prevent any kind of sex scandals if we come across any of this please uh, must we must face them right away we must repent and stop it right away and what damage will they bring they will damage our relationship with God damage our ministry damage our marriage damage our whole life I have seen three pastors that I know personally who have committed adultery and two of them were put in prison and one of them was put on the newspaper for many days the, the newspaper ex exposed different things because the newspaper uh, seek the interview with the woman he has sex with and, and gave her much money and then this woman uh, disclosed all the secrets and uh, it was a shame to the church at that time that to that church and uh, it brought much damage and also many Christians many people don't want to go to church because of that and many people don't want to believe in Jesus because of that so this is attack of Satan through people's sin Satan's attack is not from our when we do ministry of God when we drive our demons from people Satan can attack us but Satan can attack us when we have sins and how to avoid temptation from opposite sex 
that we want to uh, build up a close relationship with our spouse we want to appreciate our spouse and knowing that when we love our spouse then we build up a good relationship then we can enjoy marriage and then the marriage we will become a strength for our life and for our ministry our spouse can help us in our ministry and then we want uh, when we help people of, of the opposite sex we want to uh, have a distance we want to um, also uh, let women take care of women mostly but sometimes it's unavo unavoidable that a pastor will take care of women then we don't want to take care of one woman all the time and we want other people to be present we want to minister to them in the public that way uh, then it doesn't give the devil a foothold so any way that can bring temptation we want to be careful now sometimes the pastor does not have the heart but the woman might have the heart because uh, the woman is lonely and then she sees the care of the pastor and she is uh, very happy and she's attracted and then she wants to hold on to the pastor sometimes it's like that so the pastor want to give uh, doesn't want to give uh, uh, the idea to the woman that I want to be with you and also the pastor should build up a good relationship with the wife and talk about the wife publicly talk about how I build up my relationship with my wife and how my, my wife is precious to me and how we treat each other and how we uh, uh, really hold uh, maintain our marriage in the best condition so we want to have public testimony of our marriage and we encourage people who serve God do the same too so that other people will be reminded uh, not to let that become a foothold for the devil okay and what will interpersonal problems do to a church uh, in interpersonal problems so if a pastor or some people they have hatred for each other they cannot forgive each other they yell at each other they uh, they hurt each other what will happen is it will bring uh, fighting in the church and division in the church and many people can leave the church so interpersonal problem can destroy a church and how to prevent it we want to listen train the people to listen to the needs of the people to be caring to people to love people to to respond to people and not to uh, not to hold on to our ideas but we want to listen to people and be, to be kind and humble to people and submit to one another and if we think someone is wrong we talk to the person the person doesn't listen then we find two or three so that we can handle a problem together with other people so then there are witnesses so that people won't say that we are against the person we want to handle it with a few people so that they can witness what happened and we want to handle it with care and love so that people don't feel that we are partial to them to anyone that we want to be kind to them we want to be nice to them um, so we want to uh, listen to the needs of people and when we listen to people we really f feel the feeling now we will talk about this in counseling we will feel the feeling we understand they have a reason to feel a certain way now we might not accept that way but we understand he has that feeling for instance someone says I'm very angry with the church because someone hurt me now we might say even if someone hurts you you should not feel angry he should not but the fact is he is angry maybe that other person has really hurt him but is he should not be angry but now he's angry we want to accept that yes I understand that now you are angry I know, I know that what happens makes you very angry and uh, I know that it hurts you it makes you feel unhappy and I can understand that so we accept that now it doesn't mean we'll want them to be that way all the time we'll guide them so uh, how does it affect you how does the anger affect you and do you want to do something about the anger and how can you ha handle it so we guide them to think uh, uh, how does it affect you do you want to change do you want to work on it so that it will 
so that uh, it won't uh, affect his relationship with the other person okay so how to prevent it is people listen to one another care about each other and have a loving relationship we as a pastor want to set a good example of loving the people caring for the people and listening to the people and how to build up interpersonal relationship the way to build up interpersonal relationship is to listen to people to be kind to them to not to accuse them but to be able to speak words of grace when we speak words of the law to tell people what to do then we want to say it gently or when we teach people uh, we want to say it gently and guide people to think instead of forcing them to change we won't never want to accuse people and force people to change so this is a, a uh, there are many skills involved in building up interpersonal relationship but the first of all is the love for people that we care for the people we care for their needs we care for their feelings so that's the first thing and then when we talk we want to talk in a way to respond to the feelings and to, to the needs and we care about them and we respond to whatever they say whatever problems they have whatever needs they have we want to respond to those uh, now we might not be able to solve all the problems but we guide them to find ways to solve the problems so that way we build up interpersonal relationship when we care about people we listen to them respond to them uh, and imagine we were that person and he's affected by that how can we respond to them how can we handle bitterness in ministry now bitterness in ministry could come from you know it could be our own bitterness that we are unhappy with the church with certain people who mistreat us then we say it is their problem they mistreated is their problem I don't want to be angry with them I don't want to carry the burdens of their sins I want to forgive them and I want to have no burdens when these people you know they hurt people I want to be able to understand them and forgive them and listen to them and be kind to them and uh, not to continue to have bitterness I have known many people who have bitterness because they say some other people mistreat me and then they continue to be angry. We don't have we don't have to be angry with people. When we're angry with people, we're destroying our life. We want to, you know, uh, rejoice with people. We want to uh, listen to people and guide them to handle their bitterness and to resolve the bitterness so that they uh, they can handle problem without anger with peace and there are pastors who say that uh, nobody likes what I do and so they get very frustrated and then they feel bitter in the uh, in the ministry and what they what we should do is to say God is happy with my ministry God remembers my ministry when I serve God sincerely God is very happy with me so I can be happy with my ministry because God is happy with me that way he is strengthened by uh, by the encouragement from God's Word because God's Word says that you know when we are faithful God is happy with us and he will bless us and when we do it to a little ones of Jesus he will bless us so God has promised to bless us so we want to be happy in our ministry and then when there are people who attack us it's fine it's their problem it, one would, we want to guide them uh, to repentance it, we want to help them to overcome their bitterness seven how do people steal the glory of God how can we stop stealing the glory of God people steal the glory of God by uh, being uh, looking for praise from people they want to say uh, uh, they want to talk about how wonderful I have been in ministry I've done so many good things I have prayed for people and they fall under the power of God and there's so much healing so when we ask people to do sharing we tell them to glorify God thank God th thank God and we sincerely say I thank God for the work of God I thank God God is uh, blessing the ministry God is healing the people I give all glory to God so in our heart we must sincerely say it's God's work it's God's work it's not my work I I want to glorify God I want to thank God for everything he has done and I don't want to 
steal the glory if anyone praises us for what we have done we thank them and then we say glory to God in the heart we'll say sincerely Lord it's your work it's your work it's not my work it's your work and I really sincerely praise you for that work so it's very important that in our heart we sincerely say it's God's work I have nothing to be proud of okay and build up the unity of the workers and the members okay now um, we we almost almost there to finish and then you can have lunch so what breaks the unity of church workers and members how to build up unity when sometimes when the workers church workers don't have love for each other they or the, sometimes one person insists that he's always right sometimes the senior pastor insists that he's always right and this can cause uh, uh, the breakage of the unity of the church so we want to be humble and listen to the people and and encourage them that we should have unity of the workers we want to love each other we want to care about each other we don't want to uh, fight with each other and compare with each other so how to build up unity the unity can be built up with teaching and with our own example that we honor people we respect people we build up people okay and then Ephesians 4 16 from whom the whole body join and knit together by what every joint supplies according to the effective working by which every part does its share causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love what should unity of the church bring the unity of the church should bring growth in love how to build up a church in unity the, uh, the, uh, to build up a church in unity we want to teach about unity how important it is that we honor each other we love each other we build up each other we care about each other and we are all united in the in a goal <coughs> of the church we want to bless the church together in uh, the uh, we should give the teaching that if we do it for our own glory we, we, if we break the unity of the church then we are doing something to offend God so we won't, don't want to offend God we, when we build up the unity of the church God is very happy with us so we want to uh, build up the church and God is very happy with us when we build up the church so learn from Jesus to obey the Father the son can do nothing of himself but what he sees the father do for whatever he does the son also does in like manner so this is very important verse Jesus did nothing of himself what he sees the father do whatever he does the son will also do in like manner so Jesus does what the father does and then but the father who sent me gave me a command what I should say and what I should speak so Jesus speak what God the father told him to speak so even Jesus submit to the father like that why did Jesus only did and said what the father told him to do uh, because even in the triune God Jesus and the Holy Spirit are submissive to the father they submit that they follow God's principles of submission do most Christians workers only say and do what God told them to do now uh, they should but there are many people who don't they sometimes people accuse members sometimes they yell at members uh, sometimes they just tell people uh, if you want more money you give more money and then you get more money back that that is a prosperity teaching that so that's not what Jesus taught so sometimes people want to get results want to get money and then they say things that Jesus God did not say so we want to say things only what God has said so only want to say the words of God how can we only say and do what God told us to do that we humble ourselves and say if we say things of ourselves if we say things that is contradictory to the Bible then I'm not serving God I'm serving myself and God is not happy with me but if I tell people what Jesus has said what God has said 
then God is very happy with me and God will bless me. So we don't want to do anything to offend God. Um, handling problems, let me see how many pages do we have here. Okay, okay, we'll stop here and we'll have, uh, you'll have lunch and then we'll come back in less than one hour. Okay, and please send me messages whether you can see and hear me, clear, hear me clearly. Uh, how many groups can see me? Please send me the messages, okay? And let's close with the prayer. Dear Lord Jesus, we thank you. Lord, help us to have the right attitude to serve you that when we serve you, we want to glorify you. We want to have a sincere heart to love people and care about people. We want to do things to please you and to do God's will and not our own will. We want people to see God's wonderful quality. We want to see, uh, see people to love God and not to put their attention on us, but to put their attention onto God. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that we can serve you, that we can be your servant. And, we are very, and you are very happy when we serve God with a sincere heart to bless people and to glorify you. Lord, you, your name is to be glorified. You are an almighty God. You are, you are a powerful God. You are a wonderful God. And you can bless all of us.